So let's get into Antarctica. Well, what really makes Antarctica unique, Antarctica is a place of complete isolation. Um, there's no human civilization there. So when you think of that, only about 50,000 people visit Antarctica each year. Um, wildlife with the penguins, the penguins have no fear of humans. So when you're going ashore uh, every day for your two landings, you'll probably be within five to 10 feet of the penguins. It's quite remarkable. Um, the color of the icebergs, I think you can say the same, Carl, in your trip to Antarctica. You know you're gonna see penguins every day, but with these icebergs and the colors of them, teal, turquoise, 90% of these icebergs are below the surface level. So that was really remarkable. You feel really small, especially in the zodiacs, how large they are. And the, uh, the photography as well. We do have a photography program on our expedition vessels, but you will take some wonderful uh, photos, even on your iPhone. You won't believe that, but you're so close to the wildlife, you can take some great photos like that. And uh, one of my top highlights, I would say, visiting Antarctica is the expedition team that, that leads these trips. And that really does um, separate, I would say, expedition cruising from classic, uh, the expedition team. So we have anywhere from 12 to 28 guides on board, and they lead all of the hiking, the walking, zodiac cruising, kayaking, all the tours. So it's really interactive. Um, a lot of times, two guests will follow around our expedition team. Uh, Robin Aiello here on the uh, left-hand side. Uh, she's a marine biologist, graduated from Harvard University. And guests become friends with our expedition team. Uh, they'll lead you know, all the hikes ashore, but on board, daily lectures, nightly recaps, they'll host dinners. So, and they'll follow them on subsequent voyages as well. Exactly, exactly. So marine biologists, historians, geologists, ornithologists, so it's really great to have a large team because the, the main thing I see with a, a big highlight, you want to be in small groups. I think that really does make a difference. Adaptability and flexibility are key elements of expedition cruising. We don't have such a set itinerary as such. You know, we're not guaranteed to go to a particular place. It all depends on weather conditions. I work closely with the captain on this, looking at forecasts for the upcoming days and how it will affect our itinerary, whether certain areas need to be avoided, whether we need to look at plan B, C, D, and also down in the Antarctic then on ice charts, whether ice comes into play or not as well. I keep coming back to Antarctica, I suppose, because of, of the rewards that it gives us. It, it creates huge challenges, you know, to operate down here and you never know exactly how it's going to work out, but it always does. You always get this amazing experience at the end of the day and to see just the reaction of the guests that we have down here, see just how much fun and enjoyment they're having the whole time. It's just incredible. To go into a little bit more detail, we just wanted to show a map and give you a sense of some of the places that uh, we can visit on an Antarctic trip. It could be as straightforward and as simple as going from Ushuaia down to the Antarctic Peninsula and back, but we have voyages that range in length from 10 to 12 to 15 to 18 days. And the longer it is, the more of these destinations you'll take in. The full 18 days will mean that you'll take in the Falklands and South Georgia. And it just means more opportunities to get out, to get off of the ship, to explore, to kayak, to Zodiac cruise, uh, to see different species of wildlife, that sort of thing. So 
uh, if they've got the time and if they've got the means, longer is better because it's not uncommon to find someone uh, on a voyage and get them talking to the expedition team and they're already thinking about their second visit. They want to come back to Antarctica before they finish their first one because they've heard so much about, for example, South Georgia or the Falklands. Not uncommon to hear that at all. Hey, Carl, quick question. Uh, with Antarctica, what makes Silver Sea's package so unique? What do we include and make it quite easy for clients to get to Ushuaia? Well, it's everything. So for, upon arrival in, um, excuse me, in Buenos Aires or in Santiago, there's an overnight there. Then we fly as a group on a charter flight or a, a group flight down to Ushuaia. We all meet up uh, and head to the ship together. We're even including things like the parka, for example. So these red parkas that you see everyone wearing, those are included. Of course, we'll give them a comprehensive packing list telling about all the other gear that they need. Um, there's a really important piece of gear that we need to talk about. Do you want to touch on that, Rachel? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> probably the other question that we get a lot with gear, of course, the park is included, but do I um, need to pack hiking boots? What type of shoes am I going to wear ashore? Well, you're going to need to wear waterproof boots. And I highly recommend to order the boots because they're quite heavy, about five pounds. So you really don't want to pack them. Um, but you'll rent the boots and they'll be in the suite. And then at the end of the voyage, you just leave the boots uh, in the suite. So it makes it quite easy, but every day you will wear these boots ashore because you're in about calf deep of water every time you're getting in and out of a Zodiac. Right. And this would be a pretty typical landing, you know, departing the ship and, and uh, arriving at a place like this that's just teeming with penguins, hundreds of them heading into the ocean, hundreds of them coming back out of the ocean. There are guidelines around how close we are allowed to approach the wildlife and approach the penguins, but they haven't read those same guidelines and they don't follow the same rules, so it's not uncommon for them to waddle up to us. They're super, super curious. They're very, very safe. They don't pose a threat to us at all, uh, but this is part of the experience and you love the interaction. Rachel, you touched on photography before. Uh, you can see people here using a beautiful long lens and, and a single lens reflex camera, but a lot of people using iPhones. So, you know, you don't have to be a master photographer because we also have a, a onboard photographer and onboard videographer. And at the end of the voyage, every guest will receive a USB with a, a small film that was made about the voyage and with a number of still images as well. It's amazing how close you can get to the wildlife, not just the penguins, but the elephant seals. Yeah, and it just lends itself to, to such incredible photography. It's such a stunning place. And it's one of those places, one of the few places left on Earth where you can see huge concentrations of wildlife like this. Wow. I mean, not just thousands, but hundreds of thousands of penguins. Wow. Yeah, in some spots. Um, so in November through, I would say, probably mid-December, you're going to see the penguins nesting, so you'll see the eggs. And then towards the end of the December into early January is when you're going to see the baby penguins. So the chicks, like in this photo here, are quite fluffy. So I recommend if your clients say, I really want to see baby penguins, take a look at a voyage end of December and into uh, January. And if they love penguins in general, or even if they didn't think they did, they're going to love them by the end. They're just... Uh, so much fun to watch. They look awkward on land. They're very, very graceful in the water. They're fearless uh, and just a lot of fun to watch. And on a peninsula voyage, you will likely see three different species of penguins. Mm -hmm. and, and Carl, go back to that because with um, South Georgia, we see a lot to guess um, their first trip is a 10 day voyage, but then a couple of years later, they want to book that 18 day voyage so that they can see the king penguins. A lot of them just have that checklist to see the king penguins. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, they, they start to wanna to see all of the different penguin species in the world. So it means they've gotta go back a second time. So it's good. Love it. We hope they come back. One of the other activities that's really important is, is Zodiac cruising. It's one of the ways that we can get up close and, and see a lot more Rachel, I think this was on your voyage? Yes, this was um, down in the peninsula, Sierra Cove, which is a great area. Um, hopefully you can see humpback whales bubble feeding. This particular day, a couple years ago, the sun was out. As you can imagine, you know, most days it is sunny in Antarctica. So it might be colder, I would say, Carl, than in Toronto for you. Um, yeah. But uh, 
it's always small groups. And going back to that with the expedition team, up to 28 guides, usually there's eight to 10 guests in a Zodiac. So um, a lot of uh, opportunities to move around in the Zodiac, take photos here, but let's click through a couple of these images um, from my trip. You're gonna see these gorgeous um, icebergs and the colors of them. I mean, you feel really small. Look at this photo here, the Zodiac and how large they are. And then being within a couple feet um, of the humpback whales is just remarkable. And every day is, is something different. You know, if your clients went there two years ago, if they're looking at another voyage next year, they're going to have a different experience there. Um, this photo that, that was on my trip a couple of years ago, we were within five feet of about six humpback whales bubble feeding for about an hour and a half. Um, so, you know, Amazing. It's, a, it's a trip of a lifetime. And and Carl, uh, wouldn't you say with some of the questions we get uh, about the landings or Zodiac cruising, how much time do you spend ashore exploring a day, would you say? Ashore, probably a total of three to four hours and another three to four hours Zodiac cruising or there might be some other activities in there. We'll touch on that in a second. Uh, but on a good day when we've got two landings, we make sure that every group gets ashore for about an hour and a half to two hours each time. So total three to four hours on land. Uh, each day, which, you know, for most people is sufficient. They they go thinking they want to spend hours and hours and hours. And by the third or fourth day, you know, they're processing. It. It's, a, it's a lot to take in uh, in Antarctic. It's unlike any place you've ever been. Yeah, I agree. Even some of the other photos you get, seeing the fur seals, uh, Silver Sea does include complimentary kayaking. Uh, so this is included on the Silver Cloud. We have eight double kayaks. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet on board. It is a lottery system, how we work that, but it is complimentary. We do have all the gear for clients to use, uh, dry suits, and we have a couple of kayak guides. So this is just another way um, that they can explore. So something we wanted to touch on as well is, you know, we talked about a fairly traditional way of getting to Antarctica, and that's sailing from the southern tip of South America. Starting in mid-December of 2021, Silver Sea are launching our Antarctica Bridge program. Uh, we sometimes call it the Fly Cruise program. So beginning in Punta Arenas, Chile, the 36 hour crossing that it normally takes to sail from the southern tip of South America to uh, the South Shetland Islands and, and into the Antarctic Peninsula, that's reduced to a two hour flight. So the timeline looks a little bit like this. We arrive in Punta Arenas, overnight there, board the special aircraft that flies us over to Antarctica the next day. We still spend the same amount of time in Antarctica. We still spend six, six days um, in and around exploring the peninsula and the South Shetlands, and then do it all in reverse. Back to the airstrip, fly back over to Punta Arenas, another night in Punta Arenas before everyone makes their way home. So, you know, when you, go, when you get questions about Antarctica, Rachel, what are the what are the main questions, either from advisors or from their clients? What's their number one concern? They're always concerned with the Drake Passage. And I think sometimes people go to YouTube and they, they type in Drake Passage. Um, you know, for the most part, you call it the Drake Lake. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree? I mean, and the other unique thing too, I would say, um, our vessels all have stabilizers and they're quite fast. Um, you know, our expedition team and the captain uh, they'll take a look at the weather patterns, and if they need to delay leaving Ushuaia, they can. Uh, so that's probably one of the most questions we get. You know, clients are concerned with the Drake, but having this six-night program where you can avoid that, I think we're really able to target um, a different demographic, too. As we've reduced the length of the voyage by at least three days, or the length of the trip. Uh, so for people that are time sensitive, they're business owners, or they're, they're uh, you know just too busy in their work lives, uh, we can address that. And again, for those people that are very, very prone to motion sickness or seasickness, by flying over the Drake Passage, we're eliminating those three days back and forth. And once you get within or between the South Shetlands and the peninsula, the weather tends to be, uh, or the seas tend to be much, much calmer. So we don't run into that motion issue. So again, this program is ideal for them. Just to give you a sense of, of what we're looking at and where we are, uh, a little bit more detail there is that the red uh, pin indicates where King George Island is. And here's a little bit more detail, the airstrip that we use and then where the ship will be waiting. So we land at the airstrip, a short walk down to the beach where the Zodiacs are waiting, and then onward to the ship. The aircraft itself is this uh, special British Aerospace 146. 
designed for short takeoff and landing. And then uh, the ship itself was refurbished in the fall of 2019. So she's uh, tip in tip top shape. Subscribe to our channel for more first class travel inspiration.